Uh, Mr. President, the situation in Gaza is an utter catastrophe. Foreign Affairs Minister has delivered a forthright address to the United Nations General Assembly calling the situation in Gaza an utter catastrophe. Winston Peters also took aim at the veto power held by the powerful countries at the UN, such as the United States. Foreign Minister, as you've heard, is front of the United Nations General Assembly and like pretty much everyone else has called for a ceasefire in the Middle East and a two-state solution. He says the Security Council's failed in its responsibility to maintain international peace and security because the veto's been used five times to prevent the Council from acting decisively. Why now calling for that ceasefire? Why not sooner? Well, we have been calling for it for a long time. I just had a chance to say it at the United Nations. As tetchy and um, pugilistic as he can be at home, he is, he is pretty good as a statesman, I think, and is, is, has strong relationships. And part of that is his political longevity. He knows a lot of these people because they, you know, he came up at the same time they did, and he's he's been an enduring presence, I guess, on on the world stage. Winston Peters is back in diplomatic mode as our foreign minister. He seems to love it a lot, actually, the foreign portfolio. You would think, you know, once you've been around for a while and you've done it a few goes, maybe you get sick of it. But I think he does enjoy, you know, glad-handing and and speaking on the the world stage. So, no, he seems uh, invigorated by it, if anything. But his role is one of the most sensitive in politics, especially as New Zealand changes its focus in the world. I think we're seeing a sea change in New Zealand foreign policy. It's a gradual one, and it's been happening for a number of years now. I think it started under the Labour-led government. It's continuing now under the coalition uh, government. And we're gradually realigning ourselves. I'm Alexia Russell, and today on The Detail, we're having a look at New Zealand's foreign policy as delivered on the world stage by veteran politician and Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters. The Democracy Project's geopolitical analyst Geoffrey Miller is here to talk about the change in direction we're taking. And Newsroom's National Affairs Editor Sam Suchdavit joins me to discuss Peter's appearance at the United Nations, his blunt message to Israel, Hamas and the US, and being heard on the world stage. Can we start with his speech a couple of days ago at the UN? He, the placement was interesting to me. 3.15 in the afternoon, a good time for eyes, but also in the coming in the wake of Russia, China, the Palestinian rep, and then him. Can you organise that kind of timing, or was it just luck? Uh, I think there's possibly a little bit of serendipity, um, but also New Zealand is highly thought of when it comes to you know multilateral organisations like the UN, um, when it comes to issues like the use of veto powers, which which the debate that he spoke in was was about, along with the Middle East, uh, New Zealand's been um, outspoken about that for a long time. So I think having that sort of credibility and and background probably helps us to to um, you know get a, a sort of plumb spot like that, so to speak. And he didn't pull his punches when it came to that, did he? And really, really called out the US. Yeah, yeah, it was quite striking actually because the the government has received a little bit of flack um, here at home in New Zealand for not speaking out more strongly about the situation in Gaza. But you had um, uh, Mr. Peters calling it a you know an utter catastrophe that it was becoming a wasteland. More than thirty two thousand people have been killed. Millions have been displaced. Warning rings in our ears that famine in Gaza is imminent. Indeed, Palestinian civilians continue to bear the brunt of Israel's military actions. Humanitarian and medical workers are being killed, and health facilities and vital infrastructures have been destroyed. And that, um, you know, Israeli uh, military, the Israeli government shouldn't be penalising Palestinian civilians for the actions of Hamas. New Zealand is gravely concerned by repeated indications from Israel that it may soon launch a military offensive into Rafah. Palestinian citizens must not be made to pay the price of defeating Hamas. So, quite striking. And as you say, you know, having a go at the United States over the the veto um, power that it's been wielding, um, albeit indirectly, didn't, didn't mention them by name, but I think the message sort of gets across when you say... Since the start of the current crisis in Gaza... The veto has been used five times to prevent the Security Council from acting decisively. This has seen the Council fail in its responsibility to maintain international peace and security. 
you know, the, the use of the veto is, is becoming a problem here. And you've got, you know, one country that has used its veto on Gaza more than any of the other permanent members. It is hard calling out your friends on the international stage. It is one of the hardest things in international relations uh, to to criticise your, your friends, to speak truth to power. But it is also one of the most valuable things that you can do precisely for that reason. This is geopolitical analyst Jeffrey Miller. And look, the United States has moved gradually over the past six months that this war has been ongoing to the point that Joe Biden has had quite terse conversations with Benjamin Netanyahu over uh, Rafa, over uh, humanitarian aid. And uh, there is some friction between uh, the US and Israel now. I think what he's doing is a mistake. I don't agree with his approach. I think it's outrageous that those four, three vehicles were hit by drones and taken out on a highway where it wasn't like it was along the shore. It wasn't like there was a convoy moving here, et cetera. Perhaps a little nudge uh, from Winston Peters from New Zealand saying, look, we're a, a Five Eyes country. We're becoming closer to the United States in all kinds of ways, but we just, we're not happy with what's happening uh, in this war and the United States role in this war. Um, we, we want to see more action on the part of the US on, on this. We are not the only country doing some nudging, and Sam Suchdeva believes international opinion is turning against Israel. I think we're starting to see it change in, in the in the West, I suppose, um, likes of the UK, I think Australia and Canada as well. You know, who have all issued statements at various points um, calling for a ceasefire, calling for Israel to, to you know, uh, act more responsibly when it comes to the war. But things are becoming more pointed. You know, the death toll is mounting. You've got the Israeli um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu talking about a date being set for a ground offensive into Rafah, which would be hugely um, dangerous and, and potentially quite violent. That's where a lot of the... Palestinian um, civilians have been fleeing to as a sort of a refuge point of safety. So if there was to be a grand assault there, you, you know, you have these people who think they have a safe haven and all of a sudden they've got, you know, the Israeli military coming in. It, it could be very, very uh, concerning. And that's why I think you've seen Winston Peters, but also, you know, a number of other foreign ministers and leaders expressing very particular concern about uh, that, that aspect of the war. Jeffrey Miller says Peter's speech was by no means a departure or strengthening of New Zealand's stance on Gaza, but the words make a bigger impact when they're spotlit. I see that the statement at the UN is pretty consistent with what they've been saying already in, in other situations. Perhaps that doesn't always get through to the New Zealand uh, public. I mean, there are many other issues that New Zealanders focus on when it gets said at the UN in front of that green background there in New York. Perhaps it just has that much more impact and we sit up and we listen and we we realise that it's, uh, it's happening and uh, that's the New Zealand foreign minister there is making the case. But I think the case has been made and it is one of the curiosities for me of, of this new government and its foreign policy is that it is speaking out quite strongly over Gaza and calling for a ceasefire. And it's not entirely on the same page as the likes of the United States. And I think that's that's to be welcomed. It's New Zealand as being a critical friend, it's working together uh, with Australia and Canada um, in issuing statements to put a little bit of pressure, I think, on on the United States as well as on Israel directly and, of course, Hamas and uh, uh, the, the opposing sides. So, uh, sometimes there are inconsist small inconsistencies. Uh, that said, I think Winston Peters' statement to the UN was quite carefully crafted in that it did not mention the United States by name. It talked about the use of the veto in the Security Council and made the case that this was not helpful. Uh, it did not say which countries had been using the veto and while Russia and China have used the veto in relation to Gaza, the United States has used its veto power three times. So I think New Zealand could be that much bolder. Uh, it is good when we speak out and we call for a ceasefire in Gaza. But when the United States is supplying so many of the weapons and, and resources to Israel, I, I think it's important to speak out about that as well. And if we do have real concerns over what Israel is doing, we also need to talk about 
uh, the United States because that is where so many of, of the weapons are coming from. But that is a difficult thing to do We're at a time when New Zealand is trying to align its foreign policy overall more closely with that of uh, the United States. It's a, it's a difficult needle to, to thread. This week, former Prime Minister Helen Clark warned that New Zealand was making an undemocratic shift back towards ANZUS after its careful work over decades to, quote, balance its economic interests, democratic values and nuclear-free and independent foreign policy. She said that we could retain that if politicians keep their nerve and are not drawn into geopolitical games driven from elsewhere. Peters said she was out of order. It is very interesting to see Winston Peters uh, come out. I did read that report and uh, it is interesting for him to publicly comment on what Helen Clark has had to say, particularly as he was the foreign minister in uh, her uh, Labour-led government uh, back in, from 2005 to 2008, uh, was his first time as foreign minister. So, you know, things have clearly changed over the last 15 years or so since Winston Peters was foreign minister under Helen Clark. New Zealand is gradually uh, realigning itself with uh, with the Western bloc, if you like. It is becoming closer with uh, what Winston Peters calls New Zealand's traditional partners, uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, uh, the Five Eyes countries uh, is often used as a shorthand. And we're moving away from what has been called the independent foreign policy, which has really uh, been New Zealand's strategy for the last 30, almost 40 years, uh, which is to not be necessarily non-aligned, but simply to try and build good relationships uh, with, with all sides. But we in New Zealand have, and it has been massively demonstrated by the electorate, we have formed the view and the policy that we ought not to have nuclear weapons in New Zealand. Now, you can't have that policy and have weapons in New Zealand, and that's the contradiction that we're working through. New Zealand did very well out of that strategy, particularly in the post-Cold War period, uh, when the focus was very much on trading relationships. As these geopolitical tensions have increased in the last well, the last decade, perhaps, uh, there has been a greater focus on security and New Zealand's solution from, as I say, the Labour government, Labour-led government, and then the Labour government with an outright majority and the now the National New Zealand First Act Coalition has been to move more in the direction of, of working more closely with uh, Western partners and emphasising uh, security relationships. So we're seeing that play out in, in lots of different ways. It is a big, big shift for New Zealand. Remember, New Zealand's biggest trading partner by far is China. Uh, we're very dependent on China for trade and we have a free trade agreement with China that is very high quality in nature. Uh, we do not have a free trade agreement with the United States. Uh, there is no free trade agreement between US, the US and New Zealand. Uh, so that is a big difference. Is it a shift back, though, in a way? I mean, were, was it a case of being sort of forced in this direction after the nuclear issue? And then now we're sort of moving back to our comfort zone? I'm not sure that that is, is accurate. I think New Zealanders have been very comfortable, actually, over the last 30, 40 years with the nuclear-free policy, that was the bedrock on which New Zealand then formed its foreign policy. And I think New Zealanders like the fact that uh, the country's foreign policy was more independent. I think it's pr probably matched well with how New Zealanders see their identity. They don't see themselves as an appendage of the United States or the United Kingdom or Australia, that New Zealand puts forward its own voice and its own interests, which are not the same as uh, those bigger uh, countries. So uh, I don't know whether it is really the natural position for New Zealand to be aligned with its Western partners. Perhaps that was the case you know, decades and decades ago. But I think New Zealanders have been quite comfortable with the independent foreign policy. I think it is quite a big shift to be going back towards uh, that old, uh, well, to go to go towards being part of, as I say, a Western bloc, and it could have real ramifications uh, down the track, uh, particularly in relation uh, to China, which is often talked about. 
Helen Clark has also complained that New Zealanders didn't vote for this, quote, lurch away from bipartisan settings. Here's Sam Suchdeva on that issue. I think where I would differ from Helen Clark, and, you know, she has been a Prime Minister, I have not, uh, sadly for me, <laughs> but... Um, I think this is more of a continuation of the trend that we saw under the last Labour government in terms of, you know, uh, warming ties with the US, concern over China and and perhaps looking to m- more towards our traditional quote unquote uh, partners. I suppose the difference is the degree of enthusiasm with which the new government is doing it, uh, whereas Labour there were at least some, I think, dissenting voices or a more nuanced approach within the last government. Uh, you know, as far as the foreign policy debate, this is this is the perennial problem. You know, we don't talk a lot about foreign policy in New Zealand and particularly in an election year. Uh, does that mean they don't have a mandate? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that's the case. You know, we the, the the nature of representative democracy is you, you know, you've got voters who vote on a b- bunch of different issues, and they can't, you know, cast a yes or no on every every single policy point. Um, is it something we should have had a more serious discussion about? You know, poss- possibly. Yeah, it's an interesting point you make, Sam, that we don't talk about foreign policy. And I, you know, Winston Peters was interviewed on um, Morning Report, and a lot of the discussion was about seeing the eclipse. <laughs> Are New Zealanders all that interested? Yeah, it, I think it, I think it is changing to a degree. There is a little bit more awareness of of you know these sort of ripple effects from the you know large events, the war in Ukraine, war in Gaza, and, and what it means for us, as well as the sort of broader geopolitical climate and U.S. China tensions are probably at the forefront of that. So. Uh, you know, I think the world is getting smaller to a degree, but on on the flip side of that, I guess you look at, um, you know, how we went through the COVID pandemic. Uh, we became very insular, as did a lot of countries, out of necessity because you were very focused on um, what was happening within our own borders, and you know maybe that's endured a little bit. So, uh, yeah, it's our, our geographical isolation helps us in some respects, but in others it's a hindrance, I guess, because we're not we don't have to think as much, I suppose, about the the country around us in the in the broader region. No, and I suppose when you're struggling with your mortgage rate rises and your rates rises and your food bills um, in a recession, then you do tend to concentrate on yourself. In yeah, terms a, a, of interest. absolutely. And that, that's natural, isn't it? You know, if you've got a lot of issues on your plate close at home, then you probably can't afford or don't have the luxury of, of thinking about some of these um you know, higher level international events, even if they do have a, you know, a flow on effect for New Zealand. So it, it makes sense that, you know, if, if you're dealing with, you know, hip pocket issues, as you, as you say, that maybe you can't sort of think about some of those broader issues. One of those broader issues is how New Zealand wangles its way into AUKUS, the US-UK-Australia treaty involving nuclear submarines. There's talk of us becoming part of a second pillar of the agreement to do with technology sharing, but Japan is most likely to be the first country off the block here. Peters doesn't like talking about it. Look, uh, I don't know why I'm being asked this by the New Zealand media, uh, and until we know the substance, what we are talking about, I don't wish to make any comment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the point that he has made is that, look, this is something the last government got in train. They were the ones that um, started work on, on, you know, exploring whether there could be a place for New Zealand. So we're just we're just continuing that. And I think he, he has a point, actually. Pillar 2 is focused on advanced technologies, and it's a little bit vague at the moment exactly what that means. Um, you know, there's things like quantum technology, I think hyper hyper um, sonic and and so on, um, well beyond my, my area of knowledge. But I think that is the area where they have said uh, they're, they're open to working with other partners. I think the nuclear submarines, just, just the nature of it, the nuclear-powered submarines, I should say, not nuclear-armed, it, it's it's so expensive and it's, it's so sensitive that it's only going to be, work with those three countries, Australia, the UK and the US, whereas they've said with Pillar 2, look, we might be able to involve others. And yeah, we've seen this week, you know, they've, they've named for the first time a country in Japan in this case as a potential partner. By the time you're listening to this, Peters will have wrapped up a meeting with US Secretary of State Antony Blinken and a senior official from the Trump administration in Washington, D.C. Is there any sense of urgency with the US election coming up and the possibility that Trump could ascend? 
Uh, probably within our, our foreign affairs establishment, the ministry, yes, things might, might be easier. And perhaps with Christopher Luxon, I think Winston Peters has studiously avoided offering any sort of opinion on, um, you know, the, the election outcome and what it would mean for New Zealand and whether we have a preference. I, I think, you know, things would get harder, cooperation would get harder. Um, if Donald Trump was to win a second term, simply because he is, he is, you know, made Don't no Mr. secret Donald of his, <laughs> yeah, he made no secret of, of being sceptical about the value of, uh, you know, military alliances, defence alliances, international alliances in general. I think so. Well, it's not know, really about making friends, is he? No, no, it's about you know America first. It's in it's in the branding, so it's it's hard to get a read. But we would be likely to see probably a um a turn inwards again, I think, rather than than outwards under Trump. Sam, does New Zealand get value for money out of these trips? This is the perennial question. I think uh, overall, yes. Not not every trip has the same amount of value, but. I think, you know, what we saw during COVID when we couldn't travel and then, um, you know, for, for a few years, actually, we sort of lagged behind other countries um, with our own policy settings in terms of opening up the border. As you do, you get a little bit of drift, I think, and you kind of lose that sense of of your place in the world and, and, you know, how we work with others. And some, you know, some people are sceptical about that and say, well, shouldn't we just be focusing on ourselves? But actually, I think, you know, what is good for the world more broadly is is generally what's good for New Zealand. So if we can have those conversations, if we can be working together, um, then that, that goes a long way. And, you know, we've, we've all experienced this. Um, you know, you can do th- some things via Zoom or via phone call, but there is a lot of stuff that it's just better to be in the room face-to-face having those conversations. And that's kind of, I think, writ large when it comes to our diplomats and, and uh, foreign ministers. Mm. And I guess, too, you know, all this time, it really the end game is chipping away at a trade deal. But there is that aspect of wanting to be a good international citizen that, New Zealand has tried to live up to for, well, forever. Yeah, yeah, and that that is um, a point of principle, but it's also self-interest, right? You know, we are a very very small country in the scheme of things in terms of population, so if we, you know, try to do things on our own, we're not always going to succeed, whereas if we can, you know, get groups together through things like the United Nations, like the World Trade Organisation, um, or our own sort of little groupings of countries as we've, we've had in the, I think, the climate space. If you can sort of build an alliance together, that, that that really helps. So I think that's where, you know, trips like this one to the United Nations and discussions there, that that's important for us. And yeah, it, it's because we think it's what's necessary for the, the or what's good for the world as a whole, but it is, is also about, you know, what's, what's best for Team New Zealand. That's it for today. The detail is supported by RNZ and New Zealand On Air. Today's episode was engineered by William Saunders and produced by Gwen McClure and Davina Zimmer. Thanks to Sam Suchdeva and Geoffrey Miller. Kakite.